Us humans really are disadvantaged physically in a lot of ways compared to other animals. We don't have big claws like a bear or a tiger, or big teeth like a wolf, a shark, or a lion. We can't quickly climb a tree like a raccoon or a monkey, or a steep mountainside like a bighorn sheep. We can't run fast like a deer, a cheetah, or a hare, or fly away like an owl. We can't dive under the water and quickly swim away like a loon can. Nor do we have a thick coat to protect us from the extreme cold like a muskox does. So how have we survived? Well, some people believe that it's because we have superior thinking abilities. But all you have to do is turn on the television and you'll see that that's not always true. I personally believe that our survival and our success as a species is due to our social bonds. We have the ability to take care of each other and to share resources and knowledge which enables us to stay safe in the face of danger. For hundreds of thousands of years, humans have been using the first form of social media. No, it was not Facebook or Twitter. It is firelight. People have gathered and still do gather around a fire and share stories. The art of storytelling is a hugely powerful tool for sharing information. The best hunting, fishing, and gathering locations, how to make tools, clothing, and shelter, and how best to avoid or deal with hazards. With writing on both stone and paper, and now with audio and video recordings and the internet, we are able to share information, knowledge, and stories at an incredibly fast rate. And science has definitely benefited from this knowledge sharing. We're able to build upon previous experiments, lessons learned, and evolving theories. We have the opportunity to not have to start over every time. Rather, we can build on what others have already learned and achieved. In this way, we can learn and achieve much more than those who came before us. You can see much, much further if you stand on the shoulders of giants. This week's gratitude is for social bonds and shared knowledge. And in this week's episode, we're going to hear from the original giant of the Bring Back the Salmon program and the creator of our classroom hatchery program, Chris Robinson. Chris is going to be teaching us about the native range of Atlantic salmon, the history of how they got into Lake Ontario, and their importance culturally, both locally and globally. But before we do that, we're going to check on our hatcheries. And this is an exciting week in the management of our hatcheries. Because if you remember last week, our eyed eggs in our warm tank had hatched into Elvin. And this week, we're going to release them from the egg condo. All right, so we're going to start with tank number one, the warmer one, our lake picture tank. Taking the lid off already. We can see that the foam from last week, there's not as much of it now. It's been taken up by the filter and filtered out of the water. Filter's running great. Our bubbler's working. temperature sitting at about six degrees that's perfect and our fish are ready to get out of this condo so these are elven also known as sack fry and they have their yolk sack below them on their belly and that's their food source. When they come out of here, we don't need to feed them. That's where they're going to be getting their nutrition. So the tank's looking great, and we are going to release them out of the condo. All right, so for this process, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the hatchery equipment. Um, for a couple of reasons. One thing, I'm, there, we do have electrical equipment here, 
and um, we're dealing with water. So for safety, I would rather have this water off as well as there's a bit of a noise and we do, now normally these fish would be going into an environment that has a current, um, but for the purpose of this classroom hatchery today, I'm just gonna give them a nice, easy, gentle ride down out of the, out of the condo and down into the rock. So my first step, I'm gonna shut off the hatchery equipment. And then I'm going to reposition the rocks because the, the gravel in there right now is holding the condo up and, um, and in place. And after these elven have come out of the condo, they're gonna go down into the gravel and they're super fragile. And I don't wanna move that gravel around afterwards at all. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna just make a nice little, a nice little pile of rocks that they can hide in after they come out of the condo um, before I open this condo up. So I'm gonna do that first. Now that I've done that, I'm going to start to open up the condo. And now I'm gonna to start to loosen off the nuts that hold this together, keeping the two pieces of the condo nice and tight together. I don't wanna accidentally squish a fish. All right, so both nuts are out. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna open it from the bottom, kind of like a butterfly opening up so that the fish can fall out. Okay, so now all that all of our elven are out of the condo and into the rocks, I'm going to do a, a step that we don't normally do in this program, but because our water temperature is a little bit warmer than normal, our risk of fungus from the dead eggs is a little bit higher. So I am going to remove as many of the dead eggs as I can. And uh, I haven't done this before, and I have, but I have this um, another high-tech uh, scientific tool. I think this one might be a SpaceX model. No, Betty Crocker. And so this is a turkey baster. And so it's going to, to suck up the egg. That's the idea, is that I should be able to get in here and grab the eggs. Perfect. Look at that. Got one dead one. All right, so that's all the dead eggs that I can see. And so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That uh, eggs that didn't survive. I don't know why they didn't, uh, but that's also a natural process. Um, but uh, yeah, so we are down to 90 fish in this tank now. So, all right, there's our fish out of the condo. Our elven are out of the condo. And it's really amazing. So we have 90 fish in here now. There's not a lot of gravel, and it's really hard to see any of the fish. They've all gone and hidden themselves under the rocks. And I want you to think about why would they do that? And you know what? I'm not even going to give you the answer. You can discuss that amongst yourselves. Why would these little fish hide in the gravel? Let's go check our other tank. So tank number two. 
filters running, air's running. Temperature sitting right at four. Condensation on the glass there. And our eggs still have not hatched. Again, nothing wrong with that. This one's looking great too. Okay, so now we are gonna hear from Chris and then after Chris's presentation, we're gonna go right into a fishy fact with Johnny. Hello, my name is Chris Robinson and I work for the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters where I'm the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Programs Manager. I work with the teams that deliver the Lake Ontario Atlantic Salmon Restoration Program, uh, the Invading Species Awareness Program and the Community Hatchery Program. Uh, that last program uh, works with hatcheries that are sort of like the ones you're learning about from Ben, uh, but are much bigger. They fill whole buildings and they're run by volunteers and they produce millions of fish for Ontario's lakes and rivers each year. I also work with the person who runs our program called Alice Peterborough. It's a bit of a strange name. It's not Alice like the name, but it's A-L-U-S and that stands for Alternative Land Use Services. Uh, which works with farmers who have some land that maybe isn't that valuable for farming, but could be very valuable for fish and wildlife, and it works to make that land better habitat for our fish and wildlife species. So the o OFH overall works on a lot of things that are trying to help our fish and wildlife populations across Ontario. You're learning about many of those things specific to Atlantic salmon and Lake Ontario from Ben and his other guests. Uh, but the OFH does things like habitat restoration, uh, running fish hatcheries to help uh, restore or uh, sustain our fisheries, and it also works to keep uh, things like invading species that are harmful to our land and our water uh, out of the province as much as we can. Uh, but I'm here today to talk about my old job. I used to run the Lake Ontario Atlantic Salmon Restoration Program for over 10 years. And because I'm so, so, so old, Ben has asked me to come in today to talk a bit about Atlantic salmon around the world, where they are, their history around the world, and also why they're so important uh, to the history of Ontario as well. So Atlantic salmon get their name, as you might imagine, because almost all of them live their adult lives somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. This map shows where they're generally found in the Atlantic and connects them back to where their home streams are, where they go to lay their eggs and where the young fish live before they're ready for the ocean. You can see over in Europe, their home streams can be, in, can be as far south as Portugal or all the way up to Northern Russia. Here in North America, they're in rivers along the eastern coast of Canada and the United States. The European Atlantic salmon usually go live in the North Sea area as adults, but some of them travel across the ocean and hang out with their North American fish between Greenland and Labrador. Iceland is an important Atlantic salmon home, and there the first known laws protecting them were made over a thousand years ago. Back then, Iceland had one of the first parliaments called the Althang, and because they didn't have writing, all of their laws were memorized and passed down by an oral tradition. In other words, by speaking them out loud so everyone could hear them. About 300 years later, writing came to Iceland, and the laws were written down then. Although Iceland has had laws protecting Atlantic salmon for over a thousand years, in fact, in Europe, people have had an even longer history with Atlantic salmon. This is a cave carving of salmon from France, and it was made about 25,000 years ago during the last ice age. Even back then, Atlantic salmon were important to people as a source of food and possibly worship, and they made this carving to commemorate them. You can see it's a pretty good image of an Atlantic salmon. They even got the adipose fin that Ben talked about in episode one, correct? Younger than that carving, but still pretty old, is this Celtic or Pictish carving from Scotland, made about 2,500 years ago. Atlantic salmon were, again, an important source of food for the Celts. They were part of their culture, too. One of the tests their warriors had to pass was called the Salmon Leap, which tested how high he could jump, just like an Atlantic salmon jumping over a waterfall. 
Atlantic salmon are still important around the world today as a food fish, though almost all of the Atlantic salmon you'll see in a grocery store or on a restaurant menu are from farmed fish that live in pens or ponds. That's because almost everywhere they live, Atlantic salmon are in a lot of trouble, and that ties into what you're learning from Ben in these videos, because you'll also see that Lake Ontario doesn't have any dark blue on it, but it once did. As the last ice age was coming to an end, the glaciers, which were once a few thousand meters thick, were melting and retreating north, leaving behind what became Lake Ontario, as well as the rest of the landscape we have today. But what they first left behind was a much bigger lake, what we call Lake Iroquois, that later shrank down into our modern Lake Ontario. You can see how the shores of today's Lake Ontario were mostly under the waters of that Lake Iroquois. Many of you living around Lake Ontario will probably see that where you live was once the bottom of that lake. Lake Iroquois was connected to the Atlantic Ocean through a river that doesn't exist anymore, and about 12,000 years ago, Atlantic salmon found that river, swam up it, and adapted to life in Lake Ontario, spending their adult lives in the freshwater lake, and then using its many rivers, particularly those on the, on the north shore of the lake, to lay their eggs in and for the unfish to live in. Over the centuries, Lake Iroquois settled down to become our modern Lake Ontario, but those Atlantic salmon stayed. And all around Lake Ontario, Atlantic salmon were an important source of food and an object of worship to the First Nations peoples here. As Europeans uh, arrived in the area, they found Atlantic salmon too. And on the screen, I have the first written report of, uh, of Atlantic salmon. Uh, it was made by some Jesuit missionaries and their men who caught some and probably had them for dinner about 350 years ago. As more pioneers came and they began to establish their farms, they still needed some food that they could rely on to survive over the winters. So they would go into the rivers and catch Atlantic salmon. There were a lot of them. They were easy to catch and they would smoke or salt the Atlantic salmon uh, for the winter and survive off of them. The pioneers also had a lot of stories about Atlantic salmon that you could walk across a river in the fall and your feet wouldn't get wet because you could just, just walk across the bats of all the fish in the river. They also said it was dangerous to take your horse into the river because it would get scared by all the Atlantic salmon swimming around and bumping into its legs and it might run away on you. They also told a story that a couple of men were fill, filling a small boat that was perched up on a log and they were filling it with salmon they were catching and pitchforking into the boat and they weren't paying attention to how many they were catching and eventually they filled the boat so full it just broke in half. With that long, long history with Atlantic salmon from back in Europe, the pioneers who settled around the shores of Lake Ontario considered what they found here to be the greatest freshwater population of the species in the world. There were at least 40 streams that they used to reproduce in, to lay their eggs in, for the unfish to live in. Some places had so many Atlantic salmon, they were actually named after the salmon. Uh, the town of Salmonville is actually the, the, the village of Terracotta now up near Orangeville. And the town of Coburg used to be known as Salmon City just over 200 years ago. We sent eggs from Lake Ontario to New Zealand and Argentina to try to create populations of Atlantic salmon there. We also sent them back to Europe to try to save some populations that were in trouble. People thought our, pop our population here was so great that it would, uh, would uh, help over there too. We had some very early laws trying to protect our Atlantic salmon, and particularly when they were running into the rivers. But uh, despite those laws protecting them, despite them being very important to people, despite them, there being so many of them, we soon lost our Atlantic salmon. You'll be learning more about what happened to Ontario's Atlantic salmon in other episodes. So this is where I'll wrap up my chat about Atlantic salmon history. Now that I've talked about Atlantic salmon, Ben asked me to talk for a bit about me and the paths I took to become a biologist and conservationist. Starting sometime around grade five, when I realized I was not going to play in the NHL or the CFL or the NBA or Major League Baseball or even professional bowling, I decided I wanted to get into conservation and biology. Around that time, I also started reading books by a famous British conservationist named Gerald Durrell. Many of his uh, books had been turned into TV shows that were on CBC or TVO or PBS. And this all helped give me some ideas on what to do and what to study and got me even more interested in uh, conservation. 
besides telling you some uh, amazing and sometimes sad conservation stories, the, these books are also very funny and they're also easy to read. So if you're interested in conservation and they're maybe in grade five or older, I'll ask Ben to include uh, the link that I have here to Gerald Drell's Wikipedia page so you can find out more information about him and what he wrote. This all kept me very focused on science and math in high school. And after I graduated from there, I went to the University of Guelph uh, for a degree in zoology. There were a lot of cool courses to take at Guelph. Back then there were seals on the campus. We got to study everything from rats to lobsters, to even playing music to mealworms to see what direction they'd move in. One of the most important courses I took there, though, was a writing course. I expect some of you might be surprised to learn that for a job in science and conservation, being able to write well is one of the most important skills you can have, but it is. It's important for a lot of jobs, but writing well has gotten me more jobs than just how good I was at science. When I first came out of university, I started working for the Ministry of Natural Resources in forestry in Ontario and I was working with one of their scientists at a fishery station on Lake Ontario. We worked on a lot of things but we specialized in taking parts of fish, scales, fins, bones from their brains and shoulders and using those like tree rings to figure out how old fish were and how fast they grew. You can look at age and growth and then compare them to water temperature or how much food was around or how much fishing was going on to learn how fish respond to their environment. While I was doing that, I started on another level of education, a master's degree. This is sort of like a dedicated science project that you spend a couple of years working on. Here's what mine looked like when it was done. My project was on a type of fish called the muscalunge, uh, also known as the water wolf and the tiger of the lakes. It's one of the largest uh, freshwater fish we have in North America. I had bones from muscalunge from all over. Uh, mainly Wisconsin and Ontario though, and the particular bone I worked on was sent in by fishermen who had caught and kept a muskie and wanted to contribute to the management of their favorite species. The bone is uh, part of the shoulder of the fish. You can see where it comes from right here and uh, with it like I described earlier you can tell how old the fish is uh, how old it grew each year and you can then look at whether warm or cold springs produce more mustelunge or whether warm or cold summers are better for growing big mustelunge and other things like that these are a pretty special fish and the people who fish for them love them so it's one of the species Ontario makes sure we look after really well the oldest muscalunge we had was a 35-year-old male from the St. Lawrence River, and the oldest female we ever had was, was this fish right here. Uh, she was 30 years old. She's the largest uh, muscalunge that's ever been uh, recorded and uh, weighed properly, uh, and she was caught in Ontario. She was born in 1958 and caught in 1988. Later, I was a biologist for the province working on streams along Lake Ontario, and I spent a little time working on walleye in different parts of Ontario, and then at last from there I moved on to the OFEH. I first started here as a fisheries research biologist, doing a lot of the same things I had done for the province, looking at how old fish were, uh, how fast they grew, and what that meant for the health of populations. And then, just over 15 years ago, the chance came to work on an important conservation project, Atlantic salmon, and uh, that pretty much completed the circle for me. So thank you for listening and watching, and if you have any questions, please pass them along to Ben, and he'll get my answers back to you uh, shortly. Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to this week's segment of Fishy Facts. I'm Johnny Nene, and this week, I'm going to talk to you about an exotic fish from Africa, the African lungfish. The African lungfish is native to Middle and West Africa as well as the northern part of South Africa. Their habitat consists of submerged plant cover along riverbanks and lakes. They have small beady eyes, a prominent snout, and two pairs of long filamentous fins which they use to help them crawl along the mud during the dry season. Their back and sides are olive brown in color with blackish or brownish spots on their body and fins. They can reach lengths of up to one meter long. 
African lungfish are omnivorous and they have been known to eat a wide variety of food items, including tree roots and seeds, mollusks and crustaceans, frogs, small fish, and even members of their own species. Lungfish spawn during the onset of the rainy season. Females will lay their eggs in nests that are built in weedy areas. Males will guard the young for up to two months. The young, or larvae, have external gills, similar to a mud puppy or an axolotl, and they are slowly absorbed as they metamorphosize into adults. Lungfish are sometimes referred to as living fossils because they have survived unchanged for nearly 400 million years. They have unique adaptations that allow them to breathe air, which is where their name comes from. Lungfish will suck air from just above the surface of the water roughly every 30 minutes. During the dry season, as rivers and lakes begin to dry up, the lungfish burrows into the muddy bottom of a river or lake bed. Once it has burrowed into the mud, the lungfish encases itself in a cocoon of mucus, which helps trap in moisture and then it enters a state called estivation, similar to hibernation. In this state, the lungfish survives by extracting nutrients from the muscle tissue in its tail, and it can survive in this state for up to four years. The lungfish resurfaces again once the rainy season arrives. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed learning about the lungfish in this week's segment. Be sure to check out next week's segment where I'll have some more cool fishy facts for you guys to learn about. Thanks everyone. Thank you Chris and Johnny for those great and informative presentations. And thank you for watching week number six of the Bring Back the Salmon Classroom Hatchery program. Be sure to join us next week when we're going to be talking about predators and prey, including a presentation from Holly Campbell from EcoSpark on benthic macroinvertebrates.